Hello, welcome to my podcast entitled The Right Experience. I'm Dr. William T. Wright Jr., the founder and host of this show. During the last 23 years as a professional educator, I've been fortunate enough to work and get to know some amazing leaders from all across the United States. The vision of this show is to share these podcasts with you so we can grow and learn from people who are leading others every day. Our initial focus will be on educational leaders and we'll look to expand to other disciplines down the road. When you hear something that you like, please drop us a comment, click like, or if you're viewing, viewing us via YouTube, please by all means click that like button and most of all, that subscribe button. I've been absolutely amazed at the experiences and responses that we've gotten thus far from this show in just a little bit over three months. This is episode 11 of The Right Experience. My guest this time is truly a champion for public schools. She served as North Carolina's educational leader for many years. She worked diligently in her tenure to ensure that she visited all 115 school districts in North Carolina. Her dedication to students and staff continues even to this day in her new role that we'll hear about shortly. My guest this evening is Dr. June St. Clair Atkinson. Dr. Atkinson is the first woman elected state superintendent of the public schools of North Carolina, and she served in that position from August of 2005 until December of 2016. She currently serves as the CEO of Emerald Education. During her tenure as state superintendent, she led efforts to move the high school graduation rate from 68% to an all-time high of nearly 86%. She has visited all 115 school districts and devoted her time as state superintendent to listening to the voices of educators, parents, students, and business people, and working to make positive changes for students. During her career, she served as chief consultant and director in the areas of business education, career and technical education, and instructional services within NCDPI. A former business education teacher like myself in rural Oak, Virginia and Charlotte, North Carolina, Dr. Agnison has been involved in professional development instruction and curriculum development throughout her career. She's received numerous awards, such as the Champion of Children Award from the North Carolina Association of School Administrators, the State Policy Maker of the Year Award from the National Association for State Educational Technology Directors, Friends of the Arts Awards from the North Carolina Arts Education Association, and the North Carolina Association of Educators Inclusive Leadership Award. Delta Kappa Gamma, an educational society, awarded her also its prestigious Founders Award. She's been inducted into the East Carolina Education Hall of Fame, been recognized as an outstanding alumna of North Carolina State University, and received the University of North Carolina at Wilmington's Razor Walker Award. She's also received the Order of the Longleaf Pine and the Francis Jones Trailblazer Award from NCASD. Most recently also, the North Carolina Chamber of Commerce awarded her its Public Service Award at its annual meeting. She's the author of several textbooks, including Help with Computers, Exploring Business and Computer Careers, and a children's book entitled The T-Shirt Named Z. In addition, Dr. Agnesen has held many professional offices, including the president of the National Business Education Association and presidents in both the National Council of Great of Chief State School Officers and the State Career Technical National Association. She holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Radford University, a master's degree in vocational and technical edu edu education from Virginia Tech, and a doctorate in educational leadership and policy from North Carolina State University, and recently Campbell University awarded her a doctorate of humane letters. She is married to Dr. William Gurley, a Cary orthodontist and is a member of the First United Methodist Church of Cary. And at this time, I'd like to welcome to The Right Experience, Dr. June Atkinson. Well, thank you, Dr. Wright, for having me on The Right Experience. I thank you for doing a 
wonderful job in helping educators to become better through your pro- podcast. Well, thank you very much. Um, I, I'm I'm certainly excited to have you here. Uh, certainly, uh, I got the opportunity to be uh, the product of of your leadership uh, during your time as state superintendent. Um, and I certainly uh, am, am appreciative of the fact that you thought a little bit about little old me uh, to come on this show. So certainly glad to have you. Okay. Um, Dr. Atkinson, you, we'll get right into the questions. Uh, we've heard now that you are uh, in the intro that you are now the CEO of Emerald Education. So tell us a little bit about that work and, and uh, what you're involved in currently. Well, Emerald Education is devoted to professional development and um, assistance to local school districts to become better and to do a better job in making sure that each child learns well. And our focus has been in mathematics primarily. And we have also uh, we are also working with one of the largest school districts in the United States in developing and piloting an online uh, face to face curriculum materials that can be used in kindergarten through grade eight. So this is exciting work. Um, The people who work for Emerald Education do the work and they ask me every so often for advice and uh, evaluation. And I'm pleased to work with those colleagues. Uh, In addition, I am uh, teaching or I will be teaching a course this fall at North Carolina State University entitled Politics and Policy Making in Education. And oh, last okay. year, I taught, co-taught that course with Dr. Mike Ward, a former superintendent. So he and I will be teaching that course again, again this semester. And it's wonderful to be in the presence of educators uh, throughout North Carolina who are taking that class. And I must give her for County a shout out because in the last course, there were uh, some people from Hereford County and those people did really, really well in that class. Thank thank you. Thank you very much. I trained them well. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Uh, I think you also may have another one of our employees that's going to be in uh, taking some doctoral classes for sure. And I think maybe that one uh, coming up uh, very soon. Uh, She just got uh, accepted into uh, interstate and will be uh, doing her doctoral studies. So that's a good thing. Being that I'm a two-time graduate of state, I, I certainly try to keep keep, keep you all um, employed for sure. <laughs> How about that? Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Dr. Atkinson, during your time as state superintendent, um, tell us about what you believe might have been some of your most uh, significant accomplishments. Okay. Well, I considered it a privilege and an honor to work for all the children in North Carolina to help them become um, adults with compassion and with skills to continue their education and lifelong learning. And uh, when I became superintendent, uh, I recognized that our graduation rate was just 68 percent. And having a background in career technical education and business, I recognized that employers don't necessarily ask, what did you make on your uh, math one end of course exam or on your biology exam? They ask if you received a diploma. And I was fortunate enough to be in a thought group of business people. And I was talking to them about uh, that I wanted to decrease our dropout rate. And through that conversation, the people said, well, why don't you take it to be something positive, to increase the graduation rate, because dropout rate uh, has a different connotation. So uh, in working with staff and people throughout North Carolina, I was so pleased that our graduation rate went from 68% to an all-time high of 86%. And that took a lot of work on behalf of local school districts and teachers, and because we know that getting a diploma depends on that kindergarten teacher doing a great job, as well as the first grade teacher and all the teachers throughout the school. And so I was pleased that that goal of reaching an all-time high of 86% was achieved. Also, another accomplishment, including uh, upgrading, uh, getting to 5.0 of our state technology system, our informational technology system now being used in all school districts in North Carolina. 
And we were fortunate enough to, through collaborative initiatives, to get Race to the Top money. And the Race to the Top dollars gave us funds to get to what we now call home base. And uh, I remember standing in front of the superintendent saying to them, uh, we have to move quickly. We need to transition from our old system to the new system home base, and we need to do it soon. And uh, my many of my superintendent colleagues were doubting Thomas's. They did not believe that we could do it. But we uh, instituted that system, and it was operational 16 mon- months later, and it was under budget. Now, we had problems, as with any system, but we did, uh, the system is working, as, as with any technology system, uh, it always needs to have continuous improvement. So I thought that that was an accomplishment. Another accomplishment that I hope that my colleagues who were in the superintendency uh, would say is that I was willing to listen and to take ideas from them and to act on those ideas where I had a chance to do so. So uh, I am appreciative of the relationship I had the superintendents. Uh, I also thought it was best for public education to have a collaborative and coordinated um, working relationship with the State Board of Education. So I consider that as a plus. Uh, Another one is that we don't hear a lot about, but it's become institutionalized, and that's a great thing. But Dr. Scott Rawls, who was the community college president at the time, and I uh, met at Carolina Cafe here in Raleigh, and we talked about how that our programs with community colleges were had so many rules. And if you were in Huskins, you had these rules. If you were in uh, cooperative programs, you had these rules. If you were career, I mean, uh, early college, you had these rules. So we drew out on a napkin what we thought it should be. And as a result of our work and behind the scenes, the General Assembly passed the career and college promise. And I believe that that initiative really helps our students, especially our struggling students who may not have funds to go to college to start that process. So there are some of the things for which I'm the most proud. Uh, graduation rate, home base, career and college promise, and the collaborative working relationship with people across North Carolina. Sounds like you got a ton accomplished and uh, and, and you spoke about those relationships that you formed and uh, I can certainly attest to that. Um, all of us felt like we had a direct connection to you on your leadership and we've always been very appreciative of that. Superintendents sometimes just need to be heard. So <laughs> That's exactly that's, right. That's I exactly remember right. Uh, reading a paper by the by a superintendent, I believe, who served in the late 1800s and 1900s, and he was asked to present a paper in Washington, D.C., and that paper was all about why it's necessary for state superintendents to work collaboratively hand in hand with local superintendents and why a state superintendent should have his, he said his, his ears open to the feedback of local superintendents and to be a sounding board and someone who just listens because being a local superintendent can be a very lonely job. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Amen. (laughs) That's for sure. So, so I've got a, got another one here for you. Um, th- this is my opinion. So I'll, I'll ask the question and then we'll see if you agree and if you can help us here. Okay. So it seems right now as if the government, both at the state and federal level, seems to be moving towards becoming what I call more daily, more involved in daily operations of school districts, getting more and more legislation passed down. Uh, so first of all, I guess I should ask, do you agree with that? And if so, what can be done to refocus the attention to make sure that uh, students and staff are still getting what they need as opposed to what might be politically correct? Well, uh, first of all, I believe that educators are professionals. They have gone to school to learn how to educate children. 
They are on the front lines every day. And consequently, the opinions, the strategies of local people should be respected and honored. And there should be a minimum of interference from both state and federal governments. Unfortunately, uh, people who are in Congress and people who are in the General Assembly have to run for election. True. One of those, and the majority of the budget in North Carolina goes to public education when you combine all levels. And so consequently, they want to have a say. Mm -hmm. And for the life of me, they get carried away with things like, like right now, the bill uh, about uh, our history, how we should teach history. Educate. I mean, the General Assembly should not be in that business. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess the biggest point is that we have to elect people to the General Assembly who demonstrate that they respect educators and that they're willing to listen to them. And we see ebb and flows in public education about that interference. I mean, for example, when we think of healthful living, that area has more demands as to what should be taught in the classroom than any other area because reproductive health, um, in that whole area of health. And it, uh, so there's interference there. So um, because educators, uh, because education reflects society, I believe that our, that our government leaders, our elected leaders believe they have a right to interfere. And so what we have to do is to be proactive by informing them before they get to the place where they where they interfere. I know when I was superintendent, I met with well-meaning legislators who would say, I want to introduce this bill to do X. And I would want, I tried to say in a nice way, well, do you know that what you want to do is already on the books of the General Assembly? And, and, and so that is one of the areas where people run. So uh, to, for office, so it really is important to help to, to write letters to the General Assembly, to call them, to meet with them face to face when you can, face to face and say, let's change this language. And so you have to reach a compromise by making it, by helping them make it vague enough where it does not tie the hands of you as an educator. And one of the failures I had as state superintendent was convincing the, the General Assembly that they need to get out of the business <laughs> of telling school districts when to start school and when to stop school every year. I was not successful. And one of the reasons is because that there was a lobbying, there were lobbying groups lobbying for the General Assembly to indicate when schools to start the travel and tourism. So I'm mentioning that as an example, because sometimes in order to minimize the interference, you have to form partnerships with unlikely groups. So uh, one of the things that I finally caught on is that I needed to work with the travel and tourism groups mm -hmm. for them to help change that legislation. And of course, my time ran out as state superintendent. So I never got to that place, but uh, to uh, form partnerships and coalitions with unlikely groups to minimize the uh, interference and two, to help them make the legislation written so that it would be vague in nature or where it would be so broad that would give you the wiggle room to do that, which is necessary. Right. And we've got some legislation that we're uh, hoping will pass that gives us a little bit of flexibility. But that's been a long, long time coming uh, with calendars. And and we all know that it's always best if we can in that school year, uh, that that semester before Christmas for high schoolers, re really for everybody, but certainly for for our high school students. And there, there are many reasons why we need that calendar flexibility. And we right. we do appreciate that. So. 
Uh, hopefully, it's still coming, uh, Dr. Atkinson. I know you you fought tooth and nail to try to get that for us, and we we appreciate that. Well, and there I know that there were so many many bills, sure, uh, local bills, uh, giving this county and that county the flexibility, and then they all go to the rules committee, and that's where bills go to die. Uh, <laughs> exactly. So, so you have to convince the leadership uh, that's important to give that flexibility and to also indicate that you will be sensitive to the needs of travel and tourism in the state. Absolutely. So Dr. Atkinson, in your, in your mind, what should post pandemic schools look like? What should we have learned from this that we can take into the future? Yeah. Well, a long time ago, I was asked to speak in Edinburgh, Scotland about the future of technology. And I was honored to do that. I don't know how I got that honor, but uh, I wrote a paper uh, at, that I presented and the paper was called It's 2020. And little did I realize that what would happen in 2020 with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I included in the paper is that for lack of a better uh, term, Students must have, uh, as we go post-pandemic, we must make sure that each student has his or her own path that is based on assessments, that is based on their learning um, likes and dislikes. So one thing we've learned is that we can use technology as a friend mm -hmm. to help facilitate students learning through different modes and through different operations. Number two, I hope we, we have learned that having school from eight to five or eight to four or eight to three, whatever it is, uh, needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. That school should be for some students starting at 12 and ending at six at night or starting at nine. So we need to have flexible schedules for students. And we also need to have flexible schedules for teachers and that we have to contend with and embrace having online instruction and face to face instruction. So that's another thing that we've learned. I believe we've also learned that our teachers are resilient. Our principals are resilient and they're willing to do whatever is necessary to help improve student learning. The other thing that we've learned is that we have to have support systems for children that would include nurses, social workers, psychologists, uh, school counselors who will work with students with their social and emotional needs. Uh, we've learned that content, while important is and it's necessary, but it is not sufficient. Mm -hmm. So we have to address those needs also. The other thing that I hope we have learned is that we need to, uh, I cannot think of a better statement. It's been around since 1807, but you take lemons and make lemonade. Right. Really when we, that we need to start talking about creating learning gains rather than saying, addressing learning loss and we've got to create like yeah we've got to create learning gains mm -hmm. and one our research is telling us that one of the ways to address or, or to create learning gains is through one-to-one -one tutoring and so with having flexible schedules we have the opportunity to have more one-to-one -one tutoring for our students who need to accelerate their learning. Mm -hmm. very, uh, very, very, very key. Absolutely. Yeah. So I've listed quite a few things and I could go on, but yeah. you don't have all night. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you have, and I, and I could certainly listen to all of them because that's, that's the crux of what we got to do is, is uh, hopefully learn from, our experiences and and become better and uh, just just something simple as as you said as it's taking the language of um, not learning loss but addressing learning gains you know figuring out how to how to move forward is 
it, it's so key. And a lot of it is the power is in the words a lot of times and how Absolutely. we how we approach it. Exactly. So, and, so, Dr. Uh, Atkinson, what are, what are some other things that you do to stay abreast of the current trends? Uh, you, you've talked about a, a lot of things that are that are forth thinking. So how do you know which things work? OK, well, uh, fortunately, I have the time now and I take advantage of reading. Um, I read uh, Education Weekly, Education Next. Uh, I keep up with the uh, the commission all of the states. I read newspaper articles and research and all of these help me to keep up to date. Uh, Also look at an organization called ALEC, Mm A-L-E-C.com. And this is an organization um, that uh, has great influence on what passes in general assemblies. So I read uh, that website to see what may be coming down the pike in North Carolina as far as legislation. Um, so I, I read and uh, in t- and teaching at state really is very helpful in hearing the perspectives of people who are in the classroom with students every day and principals who are in buildings and with teachers in classrooms every day. And I, I found that to be a wonderful learning experience in helping me key up, keep up to date also. Uh, one thing that may sound a little strange as an answer to your question, and that is that I'm taking piano lessons. Oh, wow. I've okay. never taken piano lessons until uh, I left the superintendency, and I'd always promised myself. But one thing that that experience has taught me, again, is what it's like to be a student learning something totally new. Mm-hmm. And my experience was face-to-face with supplemental online instruction. And with the pandemic, it became all online instruction with Zoom and with the supplemental uh, learning. And so it gave me the experience of what our teachers may be experienced throughout North Carolina when they're trying to learn and teach uh, multiple students with the technology. All right. So it sounds like we got a recital in, in the future then. <laughs> yeah. I keep uh, saying that uh, uh, I'm looking forward to being invited to Carnegie Hall. There you go. I may not be able to play, but at least I could buy a ticket to hear someone else play. <laughs> but, Very good. Very good. You know, another thing that it pointed out to me, uh, I remember I was in my fifth lesson at mm-hmm. my piano teacher's home. And all of a sudden, it, I felt as if a burden had been lifted from my shoulders because I realized I am taking this class not for a grade, mm-hmm. not to impress anyone, but for my own gratification. And it's like, wow, wouldn't it be nice if all of our students could reach that same point? I'm learning this because I want to learn it and I see a need for it and it's good for me. So that's my wish for all of our students. It's a little difficult to get there in all subject matters, but I wish that for all of our students. Sure it would be nice if, if, if accountability weren't a burden, wouldn't it? Right. Sure it would. Well, that's another thing we may have learned is that our accountability system is not where it needs to be. That's right. So some of our viewers on this podcast, Dr. Atkinson, are aspiring leaders, be they teachers who aspire to be building leaders or um, building leaders who want to come to the district office or um, district office people who think they want to be a state superintendent one day, perhaps. Even yeah. uh, So what about and I'm not one of those people, by the way, <laughs> uh, but what about um, what pointers would you offer to them and especially uh, with the emphasis on trailblazing leaders like yourself, you know, as being the first uh, female state superintendent for our state. So, okay. Well, uh, first of all, I believe that we need to recognize that leaders have just one thing in common, and that is followers. Mm-hmm. And if okay. you're not, if you don't have any followers, you're not leading. You're just there by yourself. And while it's and it's important and necessary to uh, have strong ethics and strong values, 
that's not enough to develop followers. So advice that I would give when someone is moving to a leadership position is to recognize that there are about there are all types of leaders. But when you take over an organization, there's some leaders who want to create chaos so they can so they can develop new structures, organizations and focus. There are other leaders who look at the organization and see how they can improve by working with people, the organization, and the existing structure. Mm -hmm. Then there are those who create chaos because they don't know what else to do. <laughs> and one of the indications of those who want to create chaos because they don't know what else to do would be those who want to move offices. <laughs> we, we used to have this joke. Oh, so we're moving offices. That means no one knows what to do. We know that people are attached to offices. And so it'll take them seven. It'll take a lot of conversation about moving offices and reorganizing. So someone like Aristotle said he he knoweth not what to do. So he reorganized. <laughs> so you don't want to be that kind of leader. You want to come in with with, first of all, to indicate what you want to accomplish, not necessarily how to accomplish, but what you want to accomplish. And you want to put it in terms of measurable concrete. And you want to convey to the people with whom you work that you need their help and you need their advice and you need their support. Uh, for example, the graduation rate is an example. It could have been negative to say, let's reduce the dropout rate, but that didn't give a long term uh, focus. It would be increase the graduation rate, which would be a long time focus. Another um, piece of advice is to create a culture of respectful openness. Mm -hmm. Let people know that you are human and you may make mistakes. And admit your mistakes. And when you and a colleague uh, have a disagreement and there's blame, if you're the leader, it doesn't hurt you to take the blame because the person who's working with you knows who really is at fault. And so you give the benefit of the doubt and that respectful openness is very important. And I just think of an example. When I went to the superintendent's position, all of the blinds were closed in the superintendent's office. And I opened those blinds. I did it for because I can't stay in closed blinds. That's the only reason why I did it. But I bet at least 50 people commented to me about how they appreciated the blinds being open because it created a sense of transparency. Mm -hmm. And I never thought about that before. So the second piece of advice is to create that culture of respectful openness and respect people the way you want to be respected. The third is to pay attention to the little things. And if you're not the kind of person who pays attention to the little things, then find someone on your staff whom you can trust to tell you about the little things. This is another example. I started the habit of writing a personal note to each person who was hired in the Department of Public Instruction. I did that because I wanted them to feel welcome and to know them to recognize that I recognize that you're new and I want to help. And even today, former employees in the department will say, you know, I still have that note and I appreciate it. So it's taking a, uh, paying attention to the little things. It's a, a book that was written, The Purple Cow Effect. And I would encourage people to write that, uh, to read that because it's about marketing. It's saying, uh, find out what the ordinary is and go beyond the ordinary. For example, you ride down the road and you see a herd of cattle and they're all a black Angus. You don't go and tell anybody about it. But if you're riding down the road and you see a purple cow, in the midst of uh, Black Angus, then you tell people about it. So the idea is that you find the purple cow wherever you are and use that to gain, uh, to increase your communication and to gain support for whatever um, is important for the organization. 
And then a fourth piece of advice is to use a research-based framework for making change. And there are two books I recommend that would help if you don't have a framework. One is called Switch by Dan Heath. And this book is How to Make Change When Change is Hard, hard. an excellent book. And then the other one is uh, by, I have to look here just to make sure, uh, it's one by uh, Daniel Pink, To Sell is Human. And we really are in the selling business in public mm-hmm. education, especially today when only 80% of the students in North Carolina attend public schools. We are in the selling business and we don't need to forget that. And the other piece of advice, I think I'm on five now, is forget about the dot. And this is what I mean by that. If I were to show uh, a piece of paper and I put a dot in it, you would notice that dot. In leadership, sometimes when treat people treat us ways that we don't want to be treated, we remember we've got to let go of that dot and we've got to help our colleagues to let go of that dot so that we can focus on what is most important for our children rather than how someone hurt my feelings yesterday. If we acknowledge it. So there's some of the pieces of leadership kernels that I would give to people who are aspiring to be leaders. And of course, continue to learn uh, every day. There's something new and We have to be open to new ideas and uh, to admit when we make a mistake and say, we'll try harder next time. Well, what an amazing, an amazing list. I I tell you what, I, I got to go back and play this so I can jot all of that down. That's, that's, that's great stuff. Appreciate that. Um, Is there anything else that I did not cover that uh, we'd like to share? We could do another half hour, to be honest with you. Um, It's full of wisdom, and I appreciate that. But anything else that I missed that you want to share with the audience? Well, uh, first of all, I do want to thank the audience, the educators, the parents, and all the people who are contributing to uh, the education of our children. It is rocket science. And it is such important work. And I just want to thank everyone for what they're doing. Um, I don't know of a time when it's been more difficult. And I admire the superintendents who are there every day and the principals and the teachers and all the support staff. And it's hard work. And I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Dr. Axon. If you'll hold on for me just for a minute, we'll come back and close out. All right. My next podcast will air on May 20th, 2021 at 7 p.m. My guest for next week will be Dr. Monica Smith Woofter, who is formerly the superintendent of Northampton County Schools in North Carolina. And she currently serves as an assistant professor at James Madison University in Virginia. Dr. Atkinson, I want to thank you very, very much for being my guest. I appreciate your willingness to be a part of the right experience. Um, I think we found out when you were a guest in our district that you had been viewing the show. Um, I was tickled to death to learn that, and I certainly wanted to have you on as a guest. Um, And I want you to know that this platform is available if you want to come back at a later date. Uh, We'll certainly be reaching out to you and uh, just thank you for your motivational words and your leadership and and your honesty. And you always have been um, just what you stated today. You've always been a voice and, a, and an ear uh, to those of us that are uh, in education. And uh, we thank you for uh, the knowledge of that and the fact that you uh, have been uh, true to your word, that you really do care about what we think and what we're going through here in, in, in education. So thank you. Thank you for having me as a guest. And thank you, audience, for watching The Right Experience. Good evening.